Okay, good. Okay, so let's get started with the second lecture on anomalies. For those of you who need to sign the timesheets, I have them there yesterday and today. One, please, don't leave without signing them. Okay, please. Thank you. So today I talked about anomalies sort of from a nut perspective of nuts and bolts Feynman diagram calculations. And I ended with the uh, uh, derivation or the presentation of the most general set of anomalies for gauge theories in four dimensions uh, with arbitrary couplings to uh, scalars or, or anything else. And I showed that uh, in the end, the only anomalies were associated with the gauge fields themselves. So in that sense, uh, that uh, one has clashing symmetries that it's only if you want to impose several symmetries at the same time that the anomalies appear as a as a obstruction to uh, having the full set of uh, conservation laws that are naively present in the standard model. Today, I'm going to uh, draw your attention to a number of remarkable papers that uh, extend the knowledge or give a more fundamental uh, mathematical description of anomalies. Uh, and also, I'll talk about some of the applications of anomalies to physics and the standard model and beyond. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to just make a brief comment. Uh, in a 2004 review article, Adler uh, talked about the, uh, his derivation of the anomalies and the sort of debate between uh, Bell and Jakeev and Adler, and also uh, had a sort of fun statement about uh, that his paper was accepted for review. Uh, I mean, uh, but uh, it says my paper was accepted along with a signed referee report from Bill King, stating this paper opens a topic similar to old controversies of photon mass and the nature of vacuum polarization. The lesson there, as I no doubt foolishly predict, will happen here is that infinities and diagrams are really troublesome, and that if a cutoff which you, is used violates the cherished symmetry of the theory, the results do not respect the symmetry. I will also predict a long chain of papers devoted to the question the author has raised, culminating in a clever renormalizable cutoff which respects chiral symmetry, and which therefore removes Adler's extra term. Now, this was one case Bjorkane's intuition wasn't right. So. But how did, does he know Bjorkane was the referee? I think uh, Bjorkane sent him a signed copy of the. I don't know whether he sent it in 2004 or in 68. <laughs> uh, I think Bjorkane gave him a copy of the original. Okay. So, so I, as I say, I want to focus on some. this work. Uh, some remarkable papers that sort of gave a deeper understanding of anomalies. So the first paper I'll, I'll talk about is a paper by Bessem Zemino, which occurred in, in 1969, so just around the time of the anomalies. And it's a, it is a remarkable paper. It's only five pages long, but it's a very highly cited paper. Uh, in fact, it only has a few less citations than their famous supersymmetry paper. So, uh, and it has several important observations. Uh, which the first one is the uh, amino <coughs> consistency conditions. So if you remember my talk yesterday, I, the way I calculated the anomalous divergence was to essentially compute an effective action and do a gauge transformation and after trying to make it the action as gauge invariant as I could, the thing that gets left is an anomaly. So you can view the anomaly as the, the gauge transformation of applied to something. <coughs> and uh, that was the concept of the consistency condition that x and y are the vector and x and vector gauge transformations that you might apply to a functional of the vector and axial vector and whatever other fields there are. And these gauge transformations satisfy commutation relations. 
So the vector with vector gives back a vector with a structure. With, if these are arbitrary, there will be structure constants associated with the fermions, the representation of the fermions that you have. And if it's the most general set of fermions, it would be a very big group. But, and so you also know that the algebra would be vector commutated with axial vector gets back an axial vector, and two axial vectors get back a, uh, a, uh, a vector. So their observation was that the anomaly was essentially the gauge transformation of something. And so I can apply these, if I apply these commutation relations to the effective action, the first thing that hits the effective action gives me the anomaly and then I then get a constraint or a consistency condition that says the anomaly was derived as a gauge transformation of the effective action. So here they define, they more or less assume the structure of the anomaly that I have in general so that they're they're in the form where there are no anomalies in the vector gauge transformation. But in general, uh, W is their effective action. GI is then the anomalous divergences that I, uh, the long formula I showed you yesterday, where you preserved all the vector currents, but axial currents have anomalies. So they haven't said what they are. They just said, if they exist, they're defined this way. And then if you work out what these commutation relations then it implies that uh, for the axial anomaly one is that it, uh, I should say that they really focused this, pap this paper on uh, sort of SU3 cross SU3 chiral symmetry so what you might expect from the phenomenology of, because they had been working on uh, nonlinear chiral Lagrangians and in SU3 and so this is the context of this paper but it could, could be generalized so what they would say is that the axial set of axial currents transform like an octet from applying these set of commutation relations, and the, the consistency condition on the uh, on the anomaly itself that the, the axial vector transformation on it has to satisfy this commutation with uh, nothing on the other side. So it just follows from the fact that the anomaly is the gauge transformation of something. And and the fact that the, there is an algebra of the gauge transformation. Uh, they call these integrability conditions. In some sense, it says that if you know the anomalies, then there must have been some action that could exist. Now, the real definition of anomalies is such that the effective action that uh, made these anomalies can't be local. Because as I said, anything that's local, you can remove by a counterterm. So uh, here it's the fermions that are not local. So it was uh, fun to see that, that, in fact, I hadn't made any mistakes in my <laughs> calculation. And I had it confirmed. And, uh, and it did satisfy the consistency conditions. But the consistency conditions are a much broader constraint on the structure of anomaly. Uh, and the depressing part of this for me was, conversely, one can show this consistency relation can be used to determine all other terms in GI if one knows the first term. In other words, if one knows just the, the triangle diagram, all the other messy terms that I have in my formula, at least they argue from the consistency conditions, could have been just generated by saying it has to be consistent. And therefore, you could generate uh, the structure of the anomaly just by how they were defined as the variation of the effective action. And that's independent of what actually made the effective action to begin with, except that it, it has to be a true anomaly. Uh, so an, an, the structure of anomalies is actually very stringently controlled by the nature of the, the anomaly, what the anomaly is itself. And the statement here is that uh, one could compute the full set of anomalies just by knowing the Adelian case and then generalizing it by the by saying what the full set of non-Adelian currents are and their transformation properties get to the rest. Now, they had been Les and Zimino had been uh, had two very important papers on nonlinear chiral Lagrangians. So the idea is that the low energy behavior 
of, of strong interactions is uh, dominated by pions. Uh, and in the SU3 case, it's an octet of pions, so the pions that we, the three pions plus kaons, uh, form an oct octet of pseudo goldstone bosons. In the limit of chiral symmetry, they would be exact goldstone bosons. And the statement is that uh, uh, they were interested in the structure that if one determined the, the anomalies from the sort of current algebra, then could one reconstruct an effective action that produced those anomalies? Uh, in other words, it's the Goldstone boson, the octet of Goldstone bosons, which would provide the non-locality in the vertex. Uh, and, the, and the statement is, is that system capable of supporting the anomalies that are computed directly from the properties of the currents themselves. Uh, and they show that that's possible. In other words, it is possible to, in this SU3 cross SU3 case, an octet of, of Goldstone boson is sufficient to be able to integrate uh, using the consistency conditions, the anomaly, in, and generate then an effective, the effective action which, where all the non-locality comes from propagating pions and not any, not fermion loops, but nevertheless reproduces all the anomalies uh, of the SU3 cross SU3 chiral structure. In particular, there is this one term which is called the Bessemino term, which uh, involves an interaction between five pions. In other words, it's not an interaction that is necessary for the consistency of the theory for this integrability to work. Uh, it doesn't, in, so it's a new interaction that has not, it doesn't depend just on the current matrix elements. It's a strong vertex that's required if the octet of pions is going to reproduce all the structure of the anomalies. You then need this Bessemino term as part of the dynamics uh, and so this is our two very important observations that uh, have had a huge impact on how people interpret anomalies and how they, they use them. So this was an observation made in the Late, I guess it's a 1970 paper. Uh, and it had uh, important consequences then, but what, another important paper, which you should read if you're really interested in anomaly, is the paper by Witten, who sort of re looks back at the, uh, the uh, Vesemino terms and their origin and their interpretation uh, from a more mathematical perspective. And so this is a a paper that studies that, and as it says here, it's a new mathematical framework for uh, studying the best amino chiral effective action. And it shows it has a structure that goes beyond just the form of the best amino term. Uh, and he showed that you, a, a way of understanding the anomaly was from the perspective of assuming our four dimensions is a boundary of a five-dimensional space. And in some sense, the anomaly is the surface term of, of, of an operator that exists in five dimensions, but uh, is a total derivative and therefore uh, exists as, a, as a, a contribution from the boundary. And as a consequence of this, I used an analogy which was in I think uh, two dimensions of uh, trying to understand a, I guess, a particle moving on a sphere, where you sort of with a charged particle moving on a sphere, where you had a magnetic monopole at the center of the sphere, and then you would have the equivalent of anomaly term that uh, appears in the Bessemino effective action, and that term, and then the the flux going out through the where your boundary is, is actually what the anomaly is, represents. Anyway, I'm not going to, I point you to this paper as, I mean, Quinton writes very well, and it's a, a beautiful paper in many ways. But one of the observations is that, that while 
let's do this analogy of integrating a circle on a sphere as, as, as being our four-dimensional world is the boundary of where you're integrating. But you could have integrated the sphere two different ways. You could have closed the boundary on one side of the sphere or the other side. And if it's a physical answer, it should give the same result either way. And as a consequence of demanding that, then in fact the coefficient of the anomaly had to be quanti quantized. That was it. his observation it was that, uh, that, that, that in fact the anomaly was related to a quantized topological index. And in QCD, the index, if you like, or the thing that is uh, allowing quantization is the number of colors. But this paper also observed that uh, in addition to the local anomalies that we've derived, where you look at the divergence of a local current and see an anomaly, there are also global anomalies, things that aren't represented by the local theory, but are represented by sort of a, an overall uh, consistency condition on the view from the perspective of this embedding, it, it becomes clear that you need, that you can have global anomalies. One of the implications is, which I'll uh, come back to, is that if you have a theory that has uh, let's say an SU2 theory which has a no anomalies itself, but if you have an odd number of uh, left-handed multi uh, left multiplets, the theory uh, would still be anomalous by having a global anomaly. And one thing that's interesting from the perspective now of QCD is that the, um, the, best, the chiral Lagrangian framework is in some sense a dual description of QCD valid at low energy. In other words, at low energy, let's say scales below a GeV, the only active degrees of freedom, or maybe a little less to get below the vector band anyway, the effective action is just, or the non-locality is provided only by the pseudo-scalar. And therefore, in the sense of looking at physics at that energy scale, QCD, the the anomalous part of QCD is, is reproduced entirely by the, the, the structure of the, the pion. So in that sense, you have a duality between the nonlinear chiral Lagrangian plus the anomalous term being dual to the fermion theory of quarks, that's QCD. This was uh, taken further by Maldacena and his famous uh, connection between uh, this is just a representative paper, and I, I wouldn't say the same thing that I did for Witten. Witten's paper is highly readable, and, at least to me. <laughs> this one's a little more complex. But nevertheless, it's very important in the sense of uh, a set of things where he described that a theory on the boundary of five dimensions could be dual, uh, let's say, a uh, could be dual to uh, another theory in the bulb. And in some sense, this extends, uh, the reason I mention it here is it extends the duality of the chiral Lagrangian from being just a low energy duality to a duality that works on all scales. The ADS CFT correspondence, which is what I'm talking about here, uh, at least for some theories, uh, he derived it in N equal four super Yang Mills theory, which is a not quite QCD, <laughs> but uh, people have tried to say, well, it, we don't have, it still works more or less for QCD. But the idea is that, that there's a, a complete duality, a representation of the physics of, of the local field theory, but it's described as uh, in terms of a, an effective field theory on, in, the, in the bulk of ADS. Excuse me. Well, that's conjecture. This is still. Uh, unproven. Right. In the more supersymmetric versions, you would say it's proven. In the QCD case, you would say it's still uh, a conjecture in the sense of, and it, it may, and in terms of the implementation, to say it works on all scales yes. would be misrepresenting what people actually do. However, it, it has been very useful to extend the scale up so you can include vector mesons and maybe even a few, a few more states 
that then seem to fit consistently into the ADS picture being a good representation of what QCD does at energies beyond where the, just the chiral Lagrangian would be a proper description. So that in some sense, that's uh, carrying the, the Vesemino construction to uh, its fullest extent. Another remarkable paper is a paper by Tuch. Uh, instantons have been discovered as a classical solution to uh, the Yang-Mills field equations uh, by Polikoff et al. And uh, this classical solution represented the least action solution uh, where there was a net topological charge uh, of the gauge field. I haven't actually defined that, but, uh, but he's studying the non-perturbative aspects of QCD, and in the case here, so we're looking at the QCD Lagrangian, and as I say, the instanton is a, is a non-perturbative uh, but semi-classical solution. Tuff's calculation was to say how do we interpret that, well, the question how do you interpret the instanton and then what is the actual contribution of an instanton configuration to a, a, a scattering amplitude or a, a physics process in QCD. So, uh, and the instanton interpretation is that it describes, it's a Euclidean space solution and it describes a tunneling process where a vacuum state in QCD as far as the gauge fields are concerned, goes to another vacuum state in QCD. Except that the, uh, as I say, there's a non-trivial uh, uh, twist in the gauge field that means that it's not quite the same vacuum that you got get to, uh, but involves uh, a twist. So, Tuff did the cal calculation, and in this kind of calculation, where you, in some sense, view this as you're integrating over uh, the, the functional integral where you integrate over the gauge fields and you integrate over the fermion fields. Like there's a contribution that comes from the fact that the full description there involves the determinant of the, of the fermion operator uh, as part of the measure of the functional integral over the gauge fields. So we're thinking of this as that the instanton is part of the configurations that you have to integrate over to get the full act, full process and and part of that involves the fermion loops if you like in terms of this determinant of the fermion of the uh, Dirac operator. Um, and it gives a, a non-determinative but sort of semi-classical description of the of uh, QCD so it's a very non-determinative solution and this paper is, is a remarkable calculation of calculating what the fermion determinant contributes to this process. And one of the remarkable things is that the anomalies appear, if we consider QCD, the divergence of some of the axial currents in QCD are anomalous, particularly the U1 axial current. But that means if I look at the axial current for one quark, another quark, etc. They all have anomalies proportional to the, uh, instead of FF dual for photons, it's GG dual for the QCD dynamics. So, I don't know whether I have that on the So, so each flavor of, axial flavor, if you like, of, of quarks is actually has an anomaly proportional to the GG dual and the integral, the feature of an instanton is that the integral, Euclidean space integral of this GG dual is actually not zero, but it's one, or it's normalized properly, it's one. <laughs> uh, and that means that if I look at the integral of the divergence of the current, the integral is not zero, it's, it's, it's one, and it, in terms of viewing this instanton configuration as a tunneling solution from one vacuum to the other, it implies that, in fact, the num the, around this 
configuration, the number of fermions that exist in the, if you like, the ground state of the initial configuration has to change by a, a single unit. And this is called Dirac zero mode. It, it comes from about from the fact that Euclidean space, the Dirac operator, is a mapping from one space to another, but it's not the same space on either side, so you can have zero modes of the left-handed space and not have any zero modes of the right-handed space. The non-zero modes go to make all the normal contribution, make the effective action be non-zero, but if you have a zero mode, then the vacuum to vacuum transition will be zero. And you have to then have a fermion in the final state, which then, in the functional integral, makes the integral non-zero. In other words, if I, if I think of uh, the, the way that calculation is done is that you expand to do the integral over the fermion modes, you expand in an eigenbasis of, of the Dirac operator uh, so that the determinant just becomes a product of the eigenvalue. But the number of modes in, in the left-handed space doesn't have to be the same as the number of modes in the right-handed space. So if we take the case where all the modes on one side are, are uh, non-zero, there could be zero on, let's say, for the left-handed uh, fermions, and therefore you have to create one of these left-handed fermions for the transition to be non-zero. So the an anomalies associated with tell you that there are processes where uh, that the existence of the anomalies tell you that there are processes where fermions are created through tunneling processes related to instanton effects. In any case, this is a tour de force. I Tuff says there was a factor of two mistake in this calculation, which uh, I, I assume I corrected at some point. Uh, but uh, in any case, it, uh, in the end, the contribution ends up being, uh, because you're integrating over gauge fields, you have to integrate over the sizes and shapes of instantons. And so in the end, there's something unknown that you have to do of the integral over the instanton size as a contribution. But, but it, existence proves that there are processes which re violate the uh, axial theorem. Of it. Now, uh, so now I want to talk a little bit about an application of uh, a classical application of anomalies, which I've sort of probably mentioned several times already. Is that uh, that if anomalies exist, you have an obstruction that says you can't. The theory is inconsistent if you have surviving anomalies in the currents that you want to uh, involve in the gauge interaction. So if you want to gauge uh, the standard model, uh, uh, here I'm talking, uh, I guess I didn't write that down right, but no, I did, sorry. Uh, then the matter content of the theory is constrained. In other words, if we have, uh, uh, let's uh, consider a uh, theory, well, let's con consider uh, Weinberg's theory of uh, leptons, which he's famous for, 1967 paper that's the basis of the standard model. Uh, and we compute the anomalies. There's a, because the standard model is chiral, uh, the SU2 cross, the SU2 is a left hand, gauges left handed fermions, the U1 gauges both left and right. Uh, you want hypercharge. So if you compute the uh, the anomalous the anomalies of the in the standard model of a single set of leptons, you get a contribution here from the left-handed uh, leptons. I could have put it, the charge here as well. So if you like, there's an anomaly in the elect electron loop uh, with the S2 gauge fields and uh, the photon field. Uh, in addition, there are anomalies associated with the left-handed loop of, uh, of uh, the hypercharge field, and that's uh, canceled partly by the uh, uh, contribution of the doublet. So the, this is the positron contribution, this is the left-handed electron contribution. So if I just have the leptons, uh, both, both of the SU2 cross U1, uh, the SU2, the two SU2 cross U1 anomalies, which are non-zero, and you would say you can't gauge the theory. So in fact, 
the anomalies are, uh, say that the original Weinberg theory is inconsistent, there's one further global anomaly associated if we take Witten's uh, observation, then there's only a single left-handed doublet uh, of uh, fermions, and Witten would argue that there have to be at least an even number because there's an odd even sector to the theory, and you get zero if you only have one of the uh, one left-handed doublet of leptons, uh, even though there's no <coughs> local anomaly, even if there were no local anomaly. Now, in the standard model, you also get a contribution of quarks, as long as they fork carry triplet. If there's a color triplet, it's important. It gives you an extra factor of three. And then you see the quarks give a contribution to the S2 cross U1, like this, and, uh, and uh, several contributions here. But if you sum both the lepton and quark contributions in a single generation, then you get zero, and that means you can engage the standard model if you include both the quarks and leptons. Uh, and this is true in each generation. It's sort of well, taken as evidence, partly, for grand unification in the sense that uh, there's extra information for that, that the couplings of SU2 cross U1 seem to merge at high scales. And the fact that you need both leptons and quarks to have anomaly-free rep representations may give you an indication that they belong together in a high-energy version of the theory where this cancellation happens with a single uh, particle, if you like, viewed at high energy. Uh, SU5, that doesn't happen. And SU10, SO10, it does happen. But there's a single fermion representation that has both the quarks and leptons in a way that has anomaly cancellation. So that's just uh, flashing this to show that this original paper actually technically inconsistent. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, very important. So, as I mentioned, the question is this anomaly cancellation that we observe in the standard model, is it uh, is sort of a remarkable accident, or does it reflect something like random unification, uh, or compositeness, or some other thing that, that somehow brings together these uh, different parts of the standard model that now have to work together for the theory to be consistent? So. Now, of course, everybody seems to be unhappy with the standard model. So one is always looking to go beyond the standard model. And in that case, one normally has to introduce new kinds of fermions. And so as part of model building, one has to be, one element of model building is that you have to uh, include both, uh, you have to observe the fact that there should be anomaly cancellation, and therefore that's part of the model building exercise. And a feature of anomalies that's sort of somehow important is that anomalies are neither purely ultraviolet nor purely infrared phenomena. They're sort of, they're in line between, if you like. And therefore, you sometimes, just, you can't just solve anomalies at low energy and not solve them at high energy because it, Somehow the anomaly is something that cares about both. So, because, because if you could just decouple the high energy physics, then the physics theory below that scale should be a free of anomalies. Uh, that's also something your game for a long time didn't think had to be true. <laughs> Which is, uh, so now, I've already mentioned cases where we want to consider global currents in addition to dynamical currents. We've already discussed that to some extent. So the dynamical effects of anomalous, so I've talked about just uh, calculation of a specific contribution to QCD instantons. Uh, and one of the outstanding problems of the nonlinear chiral Lagrangian formulation was, uh, or Sorry, QCD was that uh, a normal cut that there seemed to be too much symmetry in QCD. In other words, if you just took the normal chiral Lagrangian, you would say there's a uh, uh, non act of Goldstone boson. It's not clear how the while the U1 axial charge has an anomaly, you can ask, does it really affect whether there's a Goldstone boson in the 
ninth axial current. We, uh, we observe, in some sense, only eight Goldstone boson. There is a particle that looks like it could have been the ninth, but it has a mass of order 900 MeV. And that mass is not something in the SU2 cross SU2 chiral symmetry. Uh, that's a big, the, the fourth three pions plus the singlet pion would have, have a mass if you just had SU2 breaking of SU2 cross SU2 to make pions heavy. You would think the singlet particle, if there were no extra effects, would be uh, more or less degenerate with the pions. But we don't see such a particle. We see a particle that might look like that, but it's at much higher energy. So QCD uh, has a U1 problem. But it's solved by Tufts calculation showing that the, the U1 chiral symmetry is actually uh, uh, anomalous. Uh, the octet currents are not anomalous. And therefore, the singlet uh, pseudoscalar meson uh, is not a Goldstone boson. And, uh, and, and it solves the immediate problem. The, uh, it introduces a new problem, which is called the theta angle problem. And so there's a, if you like, the, in the functional integral form, the phase of the fermion determinant is something which now can get a contribution from anomalous processes. It only affects the U1 chiral symmetry. And the quantization of the topological charge, or the quantization of the anomaly that uh, Witten derived says that this is an angle, it's not a continuous parameter, but the angle is measured to be very small, order 10 to the minus 10. So when people would like to, then it could be of order pi. So, uh, so it's a puzzle of, uh, of QCD, why we don't see large uh, effects coming from a theta angle. It's a new puzzle. and. Uh, I don't think there's any solution to it at the moment, although people can try to do model building to do that. There are also classical symmetries associated with the uh, barium number and lepton number violation. The SU2, the, under QCD, uh, the only current of interest that has an anomaly is the U1 axial current. But if you want to gauge the SU2 cross U1 symmetries, then the baryon number and lepton number individually have anomalies. Uh, B minus L symmetry, because of the nature of the thing, is actually has no anomalies. Uh, now, in, now, this is the electro, so there are also instantons in the SU2 cross U1 <coughs> theory, just like in QCD. So they, in principle, could contribute to processes that involve uh, uh, baryon number decay. But I think it was Tuff that showed that, uh, that the presence of the anomaly in the SU2 cross U1 gives a very small effect, in the, at least at low, low temperature, uh, gives a very small effect, and the baryon can live a long time, uh, much longer than the age of the universe. And therefore, it's not something that can explain baryon number uh, differences or lepton and baryon number differences directly. However, uh, at, at high temperature, that picture changes, and there can be a baryon number asymmetries generated via leptogenesis, which means you can generate a lepton asymmetry, which then gets converted to a baryon asymmetry uh, by processes related to the anomaly. Uh, and this just goes back to the uh, classical applications where you just have global currents and are, are studying anomalous contributions to processes. Uh, this, this is probably just the, this is a, somebody wrote out in detail what the full anomalous thing would be in a uh, SUN cross SUN theory. So U is e to the i pi, where this is a, uh, yes, but if it's SUN, it's an SUN laminate disease. So this is the best amino Witten term written out in all its glory, including the term which Witten showed had to exist that you could write as a, 
a, a term in a boundary of a five-dimensional space. So if you really want to know the details, there are some versions of these that aren't, uh, don't have all the pieces right. I think this one does, but <laughs> that is. I guess I wanted to, uh, this was a slide that I had where there are a number of anomalous baryon number processes that can occur uh, at finite baryon densities that, uh, again, at, at low or zero density or or zero temperature don't exist. So I just say that there's a whole set of... Uh... Now let me just briefly talk about some of the more, or refer to some of the, again, important papers that uh, relate to the mathematical structure of anomalies. Uh, I've mentioned topological index already and the, the geometry of gauge fields. Actually, back in the 60s, Atiyah and Singer wrote a number of papers uh, where the spectral properties of the Dirac operator, which we said played an important role in computing the fermion determinant, which was part of the measure of doing the, uh, the calculation of uh, fermion processes in field theory, uh, they studied the topological structure of gauge fields and re related that to the uh, spectral properties of the Dirac operator. And this is just a restatement that the divergence of the axial current is proportional, the singlet axial current is proportional to GG dual. And this GG dual has a, is related to the topological index of the, of the gauge field. And Zamino in particular uh, and others have uh, used relations to uh, differential geometry to analyze the structure of, of the anomalies that way. So I did just sort of point you to a few of the papers which uh, study this, this algebraic structure. Uh, now I'll just briefly mention something about the gravitational anomalies. Now, there, there's one form of gravitational anomaly which in some sense isn't really a gravitational anomaly. It's actually a flavor anomaly. In other words, in the presence of gravitational fields. So. Uh, it was observed, again, in a very old time, that the divergence of the axial current uh, we've seen ha can have FF dual contributions, but it also, the loops involving the gravitational fields can have anomalies. And, and in fact, this was calculated uh, by Kimura and others, uh, so that the divergence of the axial current was non-zero related to R times R dual, where R is the uh, Riemann tensor of the gravitational interaction. So in background, non-trivial background of gravitational fields, there's a uh, potential anomaly in the axial current. And we can check to see whether the standard model works or not. And of course, it's again, uh, if you look at the leptons, actually the gravitational anomalies are non-zero for the various pieces of the standard, the leptons, but if you add the standard leptons together, there is no anomaly. The gravitational anomaly cancels within the lepton. Similarly, the various quarks make various contributions, uh, anomalous contributions, but when you add up the total contribution, you get zero. So in the standard model in four dimensions, uh, the, uh, there are no the potential anomaly is in the U1 cross R squared uh, triangle diagram, if you like. And Therefore, but they're separately uh, uh, consistent uh, for leptons and quarks. I guess I don't really know whether that, how one interprets that. It's significant the fact that you need both quarks and leptons for the gauge anomalies to cancel, but, but you only, you can have quarks or leptons for the gravitational anomaly. But you can also have pure gravitational anomalies. In other words, the sort of the fundamental gauge anomaly is, let's say, right things as left-handed currents, and you have three left-handed currents on a triangle diagram, and that has an anomaly, and it's only if you cancel anomalies between different left-handed lepton loops that you, that you get, uh, can have anomaly cancellation in a consistent theory. So it was observed, uh, Witten actually, in the, the beautiful paper by Alvarez Gomez Witten, which talks about a lot of structure of anomalies and from two dimensions to ten dimensions. So again, it's, it's something that 
one should read, uh, and it's readable. Uh, more or less, some parts are more technical than others. Uh, but it's an observation that in four dimensions, in some sense, gravity is pseudo-real and you can't have an anomaly just of the gravitational interactions themselves. However, in other dimensions, two, six, and ten dimensions, you can have uh, gravitational anomalies just where the, uh, for a different kind, and this is again coming from fermion loops uh, in general. And so the consistency of fermions in some dimensionalities of space-time will require that you have anomaly cancellation between various contributions, but the sort of, there are raw gravitational anomalies or obstructions to defining a gravitational theory uh, in two, six, and ten dimensions. Uh, I think also one thing that's a little different here is that, and again, I'm not, I don't know the details, I don't remember the details, uh, you can also have a bosonic loop contribution that ha has an anomaly and I'm not sure whether it's six or ten dimensions. If, and it's a self, and it has to involve the pseudo tensor, otherwise <laughs> it doesn't have the same, as you might expect, that, that, that knows something about the structure of, uh, the anomaly always involves the pseudo tensor. So if you have a self dual field, so let's say in, uh, uh, so it's like self-dual field would be f mu nu is equal to f mu nu dual, so a helicity one photon. But in some dimensionalities, that would then generate a gravitational anomaly uh, if you had that analogous f equal f dual. Uh, so, it, so and in the theories of gravity, in particularly one of the supersymmetry, you have those spin a half fields, spin three halves fields, they both can have anomalies. And so in building models, in particular studying uh, models with more structure, then th there's potential for pure gravitational anomalies in addition to the anomalies that are anomalies of gauge currents in the presence of gravitational fields. Uh, this just refers to a paper where Bruno Zimino and I uh, studied the structure of gauge and gravitational anomalies and how they can be represented and the various sort of ability to transform the way the anomaly looked. It's sort of using the ability to redefine the theory, uh, but still consistently. So whether you have anomalies in the Wolf Lorentz transformation or anomalies in the general coordinate transformation. Uh, one has to, anyway, clarify the structure of the gauge interplay between gauge and gravitational anomaly. Uh, now, for the most part, I've said that uh, you can understand the four dimensions, the anomaly structure just that was worked out in uh, 1969 or something, where you had the most general anomaly structure. So at least for the point of view of saying, when do I, can I define a consistent gauge theory, or and when do I get anomalies? Uh, in some sense, that was settled back in, in 1969. However, there can be new anomalies and supersymmetry, which uh, I should have said at the beginning. I, a month ago, when I was visit, at the beginning of my visit, uh, there was a meeting at CERN uh, as a memorial to Bruno Zimino. So uh, there was a lot of looking back on his contributions, and uh, which were very important. So, of course, this is one of the most things he's most famous for was inventing space-time supersymmetry and the fact that it might be visible at scales that are accessible. So far, they haven't been. <laughs> we haven't seen them. But anyway, it involves a new set of symmetries and a new set of currents that in addition to if you have supersymmetry, they're now supercurrents. And you can ask whether they're supercurrent anomalies just like there are for the vector and axial vector currents. And the answer is yes. Uh, can have new anomalies, and in fact, the axial currents are part of a supermultiplet with other uh, spin, uh, the supercurrent and the axial anomaly are part of the same supermultiplet. So, if supersymmetry was good, you would have to study the, the anomalies together to see whether the anomalies canceled and gave you a consistent theory or, or violated. So, you have a whole set of new set of relations that involve. 
anomalies and conditions for anomaly cancellation that make uh, that you have to study. Also, uh, there are also very supersymmetry is somewhat magical in some cases. They have a very high degree of symmetry, and that means you you sometimes can get extra information which wouldn't be a property of a regular field theory, but is special to the case of supersymmetry. And Schiffman and his colleagues uh, have emphasized that there can be non-renormalization theorems or, or maybe not non-renormalization, but exact beta functions can be derived uh, in supersymmetric theories, where in normally non-supersymmetric theories, you just have a perturbative expansion that describes what the data function is, or you have to have it exactly zero. Uh, so anomalies of, of supersymmetry, etc., were an obstruction to defining consistent string theories. And in the mid-80s, uh, the first successful, or the, the, the ability to show that some string theories were actually free of both gauge and gravitational anomalies uh, was achieved by Green and Schwartz uh, in a summer, uh, well, they, there was a lot of discussion one summer and asked, I think it was the summer of 84, Bruno was there, I was there, Green and Schwartz were there, and anyway, it was the, the first demonstration that the potential anomalies that could occur in string theory in general, most string theories that people have been talking about before then had anomalies, but there were a few cases where the anomalies were, could be shown to cancel. And because of this infrared ultraviolet nature of anomalies, it was possible to study it in some sense in the effective low energy theory of the string theory, which would uh, in principle show you what the anomalies of the full theory were. So this was an important development in those days, the psychology, which isn't present today, was that it was very difficult to find string theories that were free of anomalies and in fact only a couple of them were discovered so the psychology at the time was that it's so hard to make a consistent theory it, there must be only one or two of them and then we've solved the theory of the universe well as you look at the history that wasn't quite so simple it was hard initially to make string theories but string theories ended up being much more complicated than people thought at the time one has D-brains and all sorts of other structure that are now part of understanding what a string theory really is. And so the optimism at the time is that we were close to the theory of everything and it sort of disappeared and, and maybe we have a landscape where there are 10 to the 500 theories instead of only one or two, which was sort of the idea uh, back here. So, uh, so I'll just uh, conclude. I tried to point you to a, a few very famous papers that are, are made a big difference in our understanding of what anomalies are and the applications. There are a lot more applications to physics that I haven't talked about. Uh, and uh, so, in conclusion, anomalies started as just sort of a, a curious inconsistency that drove Jack Steinberger to be an experimentalist. Uh, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> uh, one uh, and I've sort of tried to emphasize how anomalous divergence is uh, can be viewed as clashing symmetries. And uh, in addition to that, there are non renormalization theorems related to the structure of anomalies, saying it represents that these are really very fundamental elements of field theory that are basic to the structure of field theory and not just an artifact of a particular calculation or something that you have. Uh, but it's a, a qualitative property of the theory rather than a quantitative property. But it has uh, both qualitative and quantitative predictions that had in implications for uh, the generation of uh, things that led to the construction of QCD as the theory of the strong interaction. And I've tried to discuss many of the roles uh, that anomalies play in our understanding of the standard model and what make it a success. Uh, it, uh, if we didn't understand anomalies, uh, there would be inconsistencies in our understanding of the standard model. But it all seems to work, even a, in a non perturbative aspect. And in model building, if one tries to construct physics beyond the standard model, a very essential element of that is 
understanding the role of anomalies and, and constructing, making sure that the theory, when you put it all together, is free of anomalies. And while we see, saw in detail that the standard model is free, uh, that uh, it's part of the rules of doing uh, beyond the standard model model building. Of course, the people that do that are very good at it. So this is not something that's So in, in the more mathematical sense, uh, I showed it, uh, discussed the best amino consistency conditions, which were saying the anomalies are not just some property of a particular calculation of a spinner loop or something, but had to satisfy consistency conditions just from the structure of that they were anomaly. And uh, the fact that the nonlinear realizations, uh, uh, the construction of the best amino terms, in the Kyle Lagrangian description gave you the full symmetry structure, effective symmetry structure, where the low, the physics at, at low energy was described by Goldstone bosons, but we could maintain the full anomaly structure. Uh, and this is important for many other applications that aren't just QCD, but have to do with anomaly matching, where you, you argue that two theories represent the same physics, maybe over a range of momentum scales, maybe exactly. But then, if that's true, the anomalies have to match between the, the two, two theories. And therefore, it's an important constraint, or it's a way of, in some sense, showing that the two theories are dual to each other and describing the same physics. Because the anomaly, the fact that two theories have the same set of anomalies is sometimes a very strong constraint on the structure of the theory, and therefore a very non-trivial connection if you can establish uh, that not only the some aspects of matching between one theory happen, but all the anomalies match as well. And, uh, I also uh, pointed to uh, Tuff's calculation of showing uh, the instantons and, uh, related to topological structure and, uh, and the, uh, the generating the true symmetries of the theory, uh, showing how instantons can create terms that actually break the fermionic symmetries. And then more mathematically, index theorem, geometry of the case of gravitational anomalies, supersymmetry anomalies, and, uh, and also implications for the uh, structure of string theory and uh, the <coughs> fundamental nature of space and time. So it's, uh, you know, it's sort of been a remarkable thing, you know, uh, the 50 years of anomalies, or maybe if you start with Steinberger, 65 years uh, of anomalies. And in some sense, you've had surprises all along the way, and a much richer structure that's emerged as you try to understand more and more about it. Uh, and it has a very, uh, uh, anyways, it turned out to be a much more complicated and interesting field than just the frustration that uh, you've got two different answers when you try to do a calculation. So, thank you. Any question? Comment? I have a question. I have a question. <laughs> uh, I saw a paper uh, that two weeks ago so saying mm -hmm. that uh, you could see the effects of the spallerons in the standard model at LHC. Can you uh, comment at the 13 TD? I know there was another I mean, a previous computation saying that that was too small. But then there is a new one. Okay, uh, I haven't even seen it, so I, my impression would be it's too small. But yeah, because uh, my question was how reliable are those uh, non perturbative computations to really trust uh, that? Well, some of them are, are based on semi classical calculations. So they're estimates in some sense, uh, of, uh, or a contribution in the semi-classical limit, which, some of which you can calculate very precisely, but then you say, well, it's not just that simple thing, it's a more complicated structure that also contributes. So uh, I guess I don't, don't have an answer of whether would show up or whether something shows up at the LHC, you can really firmly show it's uh, related to this uh, process. I mean, are they talking about uh, fermion 
violating processes? Uh, yeah, this yeah. is what okay. violating processes. My impression is it wouldn't happen there, but it's been a while since I've studied this. Uh, like, uh, uh, so I'm one is always hoping that we'll see something interesting at the LHC. But well, we are seeing interesting stuff, but something novel. Mm -hmm. Whether it can be that novel, I don't know. <laughs> Any other question? I'd like to make a comment first. Uh, um, uh, I have enjoyed very much your overview on anomalies. Uh, I think that there is really a deep mathematical uh, structure in it, and you have contributed to it with uh, Ruben Zumino. But uh, I would say that there is one name you didn't mention, which is Roman Jacquet. And uh, I, I think mentioned one it yesterday. Excuse me? Yeah, no, okay, no, maybe, maybe I missed it. Check, because I happened to be in the Sush yeah. when uh, Bruno Zimino uh, gave uh, his lectures, and there was a uh, lively discussion between the two about uh, this uh, structure. Of, when was uh, this? Um, in the 60s? The Sush, I think it was in the 80s. 80s. The 80s. Okay, well, that's when a lot of this more mathematical yes, this is exactly, uh, exactly, exactly. aspects of the anomaly. And, and, and he was uh, showing. Uh, that uh, Bruno, uh, excuse me, that this Sumino condition was one disciple, and uh, that one could obtain yeah. the extension no, uh, from it, and uh, the extension of, of the student terms corresponded to two disciples and all that. Um, but anyway, uh, I think that uh, uh, there is a deep mathematical structure involved in this theory, you can mention now. Yeah. There is a double homological, the same thing you mentioned, but it is also yeah, I think included in your paper or, or uh, hinted at. But the question that I wanted to ask is not related directly to this. You mentioned at the end something that uh, uh, struck me uh, very strongly when you got here. It's the landscape. What is your feeling the, the, the landscape? Is it a blow for uh, uh, theory or? Uh, I mean, uh, you know that uh, theory started as a kind of uh, uh, trying to fill the the, the the aim of giving the unicity and having one theory and all that. And now comes the landscape, as you said, 10 to 500 possibilities, so... Well, we appear to live in a very unique universe, so, I mean, with a lot of parameters we don't understand, like the theta angle I mentioned, yes. uh, an angle that could be anything, naively, but it's very small, uh, or zero. So I think the arguments that it can't be zero, but Anyway, it's very small. So why is it so small where it could be uh, zero to pi? Well, it could have been zero to infinity, so it wouldn't show it. It has to be periodic. <laughs> so anyway, it's uh, And there are all the Yukawa couplings, the hierarchy of Yukawa couplings, the uh, uh, variant asymmetry, things like that, which you would like to understand in the context of a, of a bigger theory or the neutrino mass hierarchy, etc. There are a lot of parameters of the standard model that have special values that we don't understand. So, uh, or one of the most, well, two of the most clear ones, which may have different origins. One is if the standard model is correct at the very high scales, which a lot of people don't believe, uh, then why is the electroweak scale what it is? And not Planck scale or some other grand unification scale. And, uh, or why is the cosmological constant essentially the neutrino mass to the fourth power? Uh, that's what you measure uh, or you infer. And again, that could have corrections of order of Planck scale to the fourth power. So this, why is so? One of the ways out is to say the universe, uh, various piece parts of the big space are fluctuating into this or that. And we end up living in the universe we can live in. <laughs> that if you have 10 to the 500 possibilities, then maybe you actually have some probability of producing a world like this one. If you only had you know, 2,000 possibilities, the likelihood of one of them producing our universe is very small. So I don't know. Maybe it's good to have so many possibilities so that at least there's one that's like us. But I don't know that string theorists have actually shown that there's one like us. So in, in any confidence, in the sense of... It's not in the way we carry to some kind of unfolded principle that we have to be here so that... Uh... Well, yeah, I don't know. If you have the view that 
various parts of the universe can expand and then create their own universes, if you like, then uh, that very much has to do with the, uh, the nature of space and time, which I think, uh, well, I'm not an expert on. And, uh, and, and I think uh, to say we know what physics is above the Planck scale, I think, is uh, ambitious. In one of the controversies, um, I, is uh, the standard model is very interesting in the sense that in the old days, one thought there might be Landau holes. In other words, you evolve the couplings, and at some scale in the ultraviolet, they blow up. And that means the theory, even though it's renormalizable and all that, it's not really consistent because the coupling constants become non determinative And you could probably make an argument that, that, that there wasn't a way to fix it. If, blew up in the ultraviolet. So the usual interpretation would be to say, well, it probably is some a composite theory of something else. And there's a UV description of the theory that doesn't have Higgs particles or doesn't have uh, uh, right-handed uh, top forks that's fundamental objects that has some other structure. But today, with the light Higgs, all the Landau poles are in the infrared, and they're protected by the electronic symmetry breaking, so you never reach those Landau poles with one exception, and that's the U1, the hypercharge uh, U1 symmetry, and that does have a Landau pole, and I forget where it's at, something like 10 to the 10th times the uh, Planck scale. So if you're a purist, you say that obviously means the standard model is inconsistent, because you would have a Landau pole at some scale, and therefore you must solve that problem by getting rid of that Landau pole in the process of maybe explaining a lot of other things. But, uh, but then you have to believe that the normal field theory picture actually describes things beyond the Planck scale. And black holes and all that mean that there isn't, our, our vision of a flat space time doesn't make any sense uh, above that, uh, beyond that scale. Anyway, at least in the way I understand it, which is not very, very much. <laughs> so uh, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's an open question of, uh, of uh, how we really understand space and time, uh, and whether insights from anomalies and other things can help understand that. I don't know. Okay. Any other comment, question? I have one, which is related to if I take, can I, it's a question, can I take the gravitational anomaly to guide me how to introduce 500 neutrinos into the theory by asking? the gravitational anomaly to cancel? Is, shouldn't this be a guidance? We see the guidance. Well, it depends what you mean by the... If I add right-handed neutrinos, which are singlets under the gauge interaction, then as I said in four dimensions, there are no pure gravitational anomalies. So there could only be flavor, anom flavor current anomalies. But since there are no gauge interactions of the right-handed neutrinos, then there's no, there's no gauge current, gauge symmetry that couples to that. But if I went this to left, process it to right? Uh, then, and if you gauge that, then yes. you, would, you would have to worry about anomalies that involve the, the SU2s themselves have no anomalies uh, intrinsically. I mean, if you try to put SU2 or, if you look at the triangle diagram, the anomaly comes as, uh, in SU3, it would be a D symbol. In other words, a symmetric combination of the thing. In SU2, you can only have anti-symmetric. So there are no tri triangle anomalies with SU2 with itself. Or, so the only anomalies you can have are SU2, if it's with SU2, is two SU2s and, a, and whatever your flavor current is. So, uh, so you can. So the anomalies you would get there are, uh, are not, I mean, if, I, if you just said SU2 cross SU2, it wouldn't have anomalies because the SU2s are not, can't have anomalies with, any, with themselves or with anything else. So, uh, so that's a comment, Monsami, to my previous question. When I meant that you didn't mention Jakib, I was not, of course, referring 
to the anomaly, to the discovery of the anomaly yeah, yeah. itself, to the geometry of the anomaly. Yeah, no, a lot of and I was saying that can be here that was also contributed uh, to the certainly process. analyze the structure of anomalies in more detail. There are lots of people that contributed to uh, that. He was very active. Uh, probably should have emphasized that more, but uh, uh, so I agree that he made important contributions to understanding the more fundamental nature of anomaly. But my point was that there was some discussion between the room and the man about that yeah, and there are also uh, recommend the papers by Schiffman, Weinstein, etc. And, and they studied anomalies. I have some differences of opinions with how they view some of it, but some of it's uh, sort of very good. And, so, and in particular, trying to understand anomalies in the context of supersymmetry, I think that they made many important contributions. So. And they are experts on anomalies. So again, there are a set of people that uh, I just, since most of the other work was other people also worked on, and they did the supersymmetry, and I wasn't going to emphasize supersymmetry all that much because I don't have much to say about it. But anyway, but they're, they're good review articles by Schiffman and important papers uh, by that, that group on many aspects of anomalies. And, the interpretation. There's also some puzzles that are puzzling me right now with respect to low energy theorems associated with the In other words, I emphasize uh, that, that pi naught to two gamma you can sort of view as a low energy theorem and you can show that the low energy theorem doesn't get renormalized even if you do loops with all the photons and all that. Now it's not so clear when you when you have symmetries that have spontaneous symmetry breaking, how the low energy theorems are affected, I mean, the loop corrections of the gauge involving the gauge bosons that are now massive, how you uh, understand uh, what the low energy theorems are as opposed to the anomaly cancellation, the high energy theorems, if you like, associated with, say, with anomaly cancellation. So Nikolai, for example, has a series of papers talking about non-trivial structure coming from that. Uh, Schiffman and his colleagues also have emphasized in the supersymmetric context that the non-renormalization theorems as they interpret it are sort of Wilsonian non-renormalization theorems, uh, which is what they can sort of prove, but not the effective field theory low energy theorems that sometimes you derive. So there's a distinction between uh, sort of a Wilsonian renormalization group type saying how anomalies either get renormalized or don't get renormalized and what the true zero momentum scattering amplitudes are. So there's some controversies that go on there or some people that have some strong opinions <laughs> or maybe prove things. Uh, okay. Any? Okay. Yeah. In the standard model, um, yeah. the hypertenses of the different uh, multiples are fixed just by phenomenological reason. In principle, you could put any hypertense for the multiples. And uh, I guess that the cancellation of anomalies for arbitrary hypercharges doesn't occur. Do you know if it's possible to fix uniquely all the hypercharges just uh, requiring anomaly, all the anomaly cancellations? Engage in gravitation? I don't think so. I think they're, I mean, if it's just that you... You saw so three, three anomaly cancellations, three equations. How many equations are there? Yeah, if you want to, the ones I've talked about, there is a hypercharge cubed. And there's a hypercharge times SU2 squared. There's a hypercharge times SU3 squared. Uh, and gravitational one. And there's a gravitational one, R squared. So four. four there are four conditions. And uh, five hypercharges. So there's some freedom here. Yeah. Okay. Any other so we can. Okay. But most people in building beyond the standard model would want to build in more gauge groups usually. Or uh, not just uh, I mean, you stick with you, the current. For instance, you could assign a completely different hypercharge for the neutrino, so the neutrino could have a very small charge and still be compatible with anomaly cancellation. Because yeah, and I think I'm trying to remember the context, but I don't remember it. But there's something where actually, because of mixing or whatever, with either the right-handed sector or hidden sector you effectively have a very small charge mm -hmm. and uh, that you would observe as a particle due to the mixing and, and 
so you know you can always look for these things, but uh, so far the standard model has worked better than it should. So it may continue to do so. Okay, do you have any other question comment? If not, let's thank the bill again. For those of you who have to sign the question.